everybody. Welcome, welcome to the eighth COVID-19 community resources.com town hall meeting powered by the Center for Closing the Health Gap. I'm your moderator, Cincinnati City Council member, Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney. Today, we're going to talk about how COVID-19 has taken a toll on our basic needs and impacted our daily lives. Uh, we have some really great speakers. Just of spinning. course, everyone <laughs> is thinking about, thinking. about yeah. the, um, you know, the killing of, of George Floyd and the protests that are going on. So um, that would be part of our conversation as well. We invite you right now to enter your questions on the Q&A if you're on Zoom and uh, on chat if you're on Facebook Live and we, we're going to get to them. Um, but almost right away, I'm going to introduce you. normally take that long. Say one yeah, not usually. And then we'll get going, okay? So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Have you our Zoom for? So happy um, John Reichel and Lauren Harden are here making sure everything works and they're, they're getting everything together. I think right now they're trying to get Dr. Kent Robinson online. Um, you know, and just also we want to remind you that we are recording this session, okay? So that, that's what we can post it later for anyone who missed it or if there's some information you'd like to hear. Um, and we already have questions that are coming in that is so great. Um, Felicia, Bell, we're gonna to get to you in just a second. And then there's someone anonymous who's got some questions too. Let me introduce our fantastic panelists and let them say a few words and then we'll get right to your questions. Um, First of all, uh, we have uh, Reverend Damon Lynch, the third president of the Community Economic Advancement Initiatives, which we call CEAI, um, doing some great work. Also pastor of New Prospect Baptist Church. Just, you know, I mean, Reverend Lynch, we would be here all day talking about all the great work you're doing, including <laughs> the testing site that CEAI got opened for us uh, at, at the Mercy Health Complex in Bond Hill because testing is so important and the state still isn't up to the 22,000 a day that we were promised. So, you know, having that testing site there is just huge. Thank you so much and all the other great work you do. Um, we've got Greg Johnson, who's president and CEO of the Cincinnati Metropolitan Housing Authority. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have Mark Lawson, who's executive director of the Community Action Agency. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, CAA does just a huge amount of work. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, Janice Jones is going to join us. Um, she is uh, executive director of Housing Opportunities Made Equal. Um, and I know she's going to be here soon. We also have Dr. Kent Robinson. Dr. Robinson, everybody knows you. I don't know if, if you can hear me yet. Dr. Robinson was online, but there was an issue with the video. So um, you know, just know that he'll be here shortly. We're going we're to get all the tech worked out. So let me start just by asking each of you to make, you know, one or two minute quick remarks and mm -hmm. the questions have already started coming in. Mm -hmm. So let me start with Reverend Damon Lynch III. Hi, Jan Michelle and to everybody uh, who's here with us on Zoom and watching on Facebook. So it is an uh, honor to be here today. It's been already a long day for me. Um, I've had a funeral today and I've uh, been writing opinion pieces and like everybody else, been watching uh, what's happening around the nation uh, here locally and uh, elsewhere and uh, just ready for action. Uh, it's, it's time that we uh, really make a change in our communities for the betterment of, of our communities. So uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation and seeing what comes out of it. So thanks again. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Greg Johnson of CMHA. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, uh, I have to echo those words. It's been a very long day with everything that's going on in our community. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations to you uh, on this, uh, City Council, and thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, you know for having me and uh, being able to share my opinion um, uh, at, on this critical uh, topic and this critical time in our community. You know, one of my favorite uh, speakers is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and I always try to use something, and I and I think what we're getting ready to talk about and what's happening today. Uh, is best said by him, uh, one of the things he, he quotes that many quotes that he had was, uh, 
we may have all come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. Mm. So I uh, just want to leave everybody with that thought as we move forward. That's wonderful. Love that quote. Okay, uh, Mr. Mark Lawson of the Community Action Agency. Thanks, Jan, Michelle, for having me and Renee. Um, and uh, I'm just grateful and, and happy to be here with uh, such wonderful panelists. Um, and I echo those same sentiments. It's a very difficult day. Um, you know, we're devastated at CA to watch a video like that and uh, with George Floyd and to see, uh, feel utter helplessness really. Um, you just can't help but um, being helpless watching that and, and we're all, all super de devastated. Um, and so, uh, you know, CA has been around since 1964. We've, we've worked for the community for that long. Uh, we do a myriad of things, uh, including early childhood education, uh, job training, but right now we are really focused on our core work, which is really food, shelter, health, um, food. We've got our food banks going three, four times a month. And then uh, shelter, we really have, we have really ramped up on our eviction assistance programs and other things to help folks stay in their homes, which to me is directly related to health. I was a housing lawyer at Legal Aid for 20 years, and, and we all know on this panel and, and who is ever listening, the relationship with health and housing is paramount. And um, I echo what Greg said about the importance of housing. I used to always be asked as a legal aid lawyer, what's the most important thing affecting uh, the poor? And it's really hard to find a job, keep a job if you're looking for a roof over your head. Um, and so we've really doubled down at CA on, on that. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, we're waiting for uh, Janice Jones and Dr. Kent Robinson to join us. So we're going to go straight to some questions. And as soon as they get on, we'll, we'll give them a chance to, to say a few words. So the first question is for Reverend Lynch. Uh, and it says, what's the status of the collaborative agreement? And does Cincinnati's reaction last night show that it's working or not? And Reverend Lynch, you have to unmute. Reverend Lynch, you're, you're okay. All right, here we go. The agreement is still in effect. Um, there has been a refresh on the agreement. The agreement now is about 18 years old, uh, and things change in that time. So, uh, Ms. Iris Rowley and Al Gerhardstein, our uh, attorney, they're working on a refresh of the agreement to bring it up to date. Uh, when we did the agreement almost 18 years ago, uh, there were no such thing as tasers, and uh, so a lot has changed. Uh, our police forces hadn't become militarized uh, with uh, um, uh, excess military equipment. So we're working on refreshing it, but, um, and, and I don't think, um, I mean, I wasn't there last night, so I've seen videos. I don't think what happened last night, what I've seen, uh, has any effect on the collaborative agreement. Um, and so again, the agreement it still holds. As a matter of fact, we had conversations yesterday with uh, Minneapolis, and it's possible that we'll be going there, sharing the agreement and the work with them. Uh, we've shared it in Ferguson, Missouri. We've shared it in New York. As a matter of fact, if you read the judge's order, when they stop, stop and frisk in New York, he mentions the collaborative agreement. Wow. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a powerful document, and we're proud of it, and we're still proud of it. That's fantastic. I think you, you all went to Baltimore too, didn't you? Was, I, we, I, we've been to Baltimore, Ireland. Arizona, yeah. New York, Ferguson. Yeah, we've taken the agreement around the country. That's fantastic. All starting right here in Cincinnati. Thank, thank you uh, for that work. Okay, another question. What can we do to keep Cincinnati residents safe from the police and protesters? And that question is for me. Um, it's for the person didn't say. So let me just say when people put in questions, sometimes they're anonymous. Um, so we're not sure who's asking them. And sometimes they'll say this is for, a, you know, one of you, but this one is just an open end. So anyone can answer it. Well, yeah, I think well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll take a shot. I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, okay. uh, well, I, one of the things that or, or a few things that I think we can do in our community is to keep uh, one, uh, do a refresh on the collaborative, so I'm going to start there. Uh, but two, is to make sure that when we have these open lines of communication, that they're real lines of communication. 
and not to use buzzwords uh, or run to meetings and have a lot of meetings and then talk about what should happen. Let's talk about how to implement these things and make sure that they uh, can, as the implementation happens, they're for long term and not short term. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of work uh, as far as open communication for people to trust and understand um, as, as we move forward. Um, because I think now um, across the country and in our community, uh, there's a big trust gap. And, and I think we have to start there to, to start to mend uh, some of the fences. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question is actually for Mark Lawson. Uh, and it says, uh, what services does the CAA have to help people who can't pay rent? And who's eligible for those services? I know that's a big thing now, especially after COVID when so many people are out of work. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah. So like I said, we've doubled down on our eviction prevention assistance. Uh, you know, prior to COVID, uh, you know, there was a huge need. Um, and so we've got lots of different pots of money. I would say the average eligibility is if you're making around $50,000 for a family of four or below, you're eligible for assistance. Um, and so during the COVID crisis, we haven't seen as much intake as we have in the past, but we expect to see a flood when the so-called moratoriums are lifted locally, which is June 1st. Um, as Greg knows, uh, the, there's a federal moratorium so uh, CMHA is precluded from, from going forward with evictions and anybody, and let me just say this, somebody in uh, private housing renting, uh, if their landlord has a federally backed mortgage, that, that moratorium would continue beyond June 1st. It's really hard for a tenant to know that, but um, that exists. But the best way to reach us is at our number, which is 569-1840, or to go online at our website um, to see about eligibility. We're not in the building necessarily, but we're on online and, and by phone and, and very easy to get a hold of and there's money available. So please reach out to us. So, so Mark, uh, so the federal moratorium, is that just until it's lifted or is there an end date for it? Is it for a certain period of time? Or? That's until it's lifted, which I think is in December and Greg probably knows it even better than I do. The fed, right now, the federal moratorium uh, for uh, affordable housing is July the 28th, I believe. Um, is what it is right now, but there's still talks on, as Mark saying, to extending that. Um, and they're gathering information from public housing authorities across the country to see where we are, if we were to file, how many and things like that. So I'm almost certain it's gonna be extended, um, but right now it's through July the uh, 28th. And, and Jim, Jim Michelle, Michelle. Uh, Go ahead, Reverend. Lynch. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, because no, I was going to ask. Go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, what we know is that I, I, I sort of the, the moratorium, the local moratorium, is in quotes because it hasn't stopped anybody from filing evictions, and they're all just sitting there, hundreds of them, ready to go as of June first. So that's why we're expecting a huge flood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely, Reverend Lynch. So, so Jan, I don't know if the previous question is still in front of you on on safety. Uh, if it is, could you read that one more time? Okay, so the person's, and this person is anonymous. Um, so they said, what can we do to keep Cincinnati residents safe from the police and protesters? Okay, and, and, and the reason I wanted to go back to that, because there, there, that's a broad uh, question and there, there's a broad answer. Um, so when you mention protesters and, and police, you have to add, well, why were the protesters out there last night and the night before and around the country? So what can we do to keep us safe from protesters? I'm not sure that's, that's, that's really the issue, but what, what we can do is make sure that police officers don't um, kill black men in, in, our, in, our, in our country. Because uh, if that would, ha would happen to uh, uh, George Floyd, if it had not happened, there would have been no protesters last night. Not that there's always, not always a reason to protest. Uh, secondly, what you can do to keep our community safe <clears throat> is you have to build strong, healthy communities where people have opportunities for work uh, and to make living wages, uh, have affordable housing. So it, it's a huge issue. You know, the building I think behind you on, on your screen is City Hall, it looks right. like. 
possibly. Yeah. Well, if 70% of the general fund budget goes towards public safety, police, fire, EMS, uh, 911, and yet you have communities where people don't feel safe, then that says that there's a problem. And I think communities need to take safety uh, as one of their priorities. Uh, and so obviously it's, it can't come just from city hall. Uh, it has to be within the community. So when people feel safe and they feel respected, um, then you have safe communities. That's, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into that. Right, absolutely. And you know, and this isn't a part of the question, but I've heard people ask this, why are people rioting here? Is there a problem with our police here? Not, not recently. Uh, I think we have a, a, a great police chief. Uh, we've had great reforms over the last 18 years. Uh, we've implemented policies uh, that seek to protect uh, our, our community. Uh, but people are standing in solidarity with uh, Ahmad Aubrey in Brunswick, Georgia, and his family, standing in solidarity with Breonna, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, and in solidarity with George uh, Floyd in Minneapolis. And so it's important for us all to stand together to have a collective voice that uh, police brutality cannot be uh, just part of the American way anymore. Right, absolutely. And yeah, Michelle uh, Robinson has joined on by phone. Okay, great. Dr. Robinson, welcome. Dr. Robinson, you might have to unmute. Renee, can you unmute Dr. Robinson? There you go. He's unmuted. Hi, Dr. Robinson. Welcome. No, he's just remuted. Okay. <laughs> okay, Dr. Robinson, try again. Okay, I'm here. All right, fantastic. We knew you'd make it. Okay, well, you know what? We're gonna we were asking questions, but we gave everyone a chance to make a few statements, you know, one to two minutes. So we'd like to welcome you to make a few intro statements and then we'll get back to the questions. Okay, well, uh, good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Kent Robinson, a specialist in internal medicine with uh, a also a focus on prevention and, and nutrition uh, as part of healthy lifestyles. Uh, that I like to uh, practice and, and celebrate with patients. Also, I'm uh, a founder of an organization called uh, OHWI, which is uh, whose vision is optimal health and wellness for all. And just a few words here. Um, it, it, interesting, when it was first recognized that COVID-19 was an infection that more prevalently affected African Americans, it was a, a surprise for everybody. And then it was noted that certain diseases such as diabetes, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, were more common with the COVID-19 patients and pretended the more serious problem with that, uh, with, with that particular infection. And when you put it all together, uh, it all comes under the heading of uh, health disparities, because if the health disparities weren't there with management of some of these chronic medical issues, probably a lot of the increased risk for serious illness and increased ability to catch the virus wouldn't be there. And along those lines, the social determinants that we talk about that influence health and wellness are very important to note. The poverty, uh, the underinsured or not insured, food deserts, uh, uh, lack of health education, uh, being forced uh, to ration medicine as a strategy as opposed to being able to take it because you can't afford it, and finally housing. And so I'm glad to be a part of this uh, townhouse uh, discussion, townhouse discussion that's uh, focused on housing and other things related to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Robinson, we're going to have the next question for you. Um, and it says, what are some holistic medicine tips that you can give us to guard against COVID-19? I heard that taking zinc helps. And I should say, Dr. Robinson, we, we know you um, know that you do a lot of holistic medicine. Well, well let me say that we let's say this. We don't have any uh, anything in particular that I've I've noted that can fight or you know kill a virus from a holistic standpoint. But this is a big thing. And when it, when the research um, gets farther along, I think we'll see that the the problem as it relates to people with chronic medical conditions is if they're poorly controlled, the immune system is also not uh, up to snuff, so to speak. 
you have people, I have people in my practice who've had, who've been infected by COVID-19 who have multiple medical conditions that are all controlled. Those people have gone through uh, the illness and have done okay. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody uh, whose diabetes is well controlled, whose hypertension is well controlled, uh, will go through COVID and do okay, but it does suggest that uh, being well as part of having your disease processes under good control can help you fight uh, the infection. Now, having said that, um, we, we talk about the pillars of health. So rest, you know, regular exercise. In fact, when COVID first came out, we were talking about exercise tended to uh, maybe help a person not get the virus. But regular exercise, talk of sleep, uh, managing stress, which is hard uh, in society sometimes, eating healthy, keeping weight right, all those things are uh, good and help build a healthier immune system. So as you do the virus, uh, uh, the hope is that you'll be able to fight it also better. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so this next question brings um, COVID-19 and what happened last night together. And it is for Reverend Lynch. And then, you know, anyone can always jump in and answer as well. Um, but the question is, is there any connection between the rioting we saw last night and anger over COVID-19? Um, I think what, what COVID-19 has done uh, it's just caused a lot of angst in the community. People have been uh, quarantined or uh, being told to stay at home for now almost going on three months. Uh, businesses have, have been shuttered. So there's a lot of uh, uh, uneasiness in the community around <clears throat> how COVID-19 has impacted our lives. Uh, churches have been shut down now for almost three months. But I cl clearly, though, what, what we saw last night and what we're seeing around the country is a result of police brutality, a uh, longstanding issue in our country that uh, continues to rear its head. Um, and I think COVID-19 may exasperate it even more. But if they were, were not COVID-19, I think you still would have seen people go to the streets to express their anger. and. Um, to have their right to, to protest uh, until they see and because they seek justice um, for what happened. So yeah, I want to echo. Oh, Mark, go right ahead. Yeah, I'd like to echo what Reverend Lynch is saying. And, you know, when, when COVID-19 came along, it really laid bare the inequalities in our system and racial disparities that were already there. And it just laid them bare. And I think uh, in a way this is this is really piling on uh, the African American community, and, um, and and people are outraged. You know, like I said in the beginning, and, and felt helpless. And so, you know, the way to show your outrage is to protest, and it's a natural thing. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it's gotten out of hand a little bit. I, I, so I've said earlier to you guys before we started that uh, one of our families, uh, we've had four of our families at CA directly affected with COVID. Um, that are sick. And then uh, we've had a family that, uh, uh, who runs a black owned business uh, in Over the Rhine and, and their windows were smashed in last night. And so, so for them especially, it's just layering on and piling on and it's a lot for everybody to handle. Um, so. And you know, in, in my understanding, and you know, it's not really official, but my understanding is that the protesters who came late at night were different than the ones who were protesting earlier because of the police brutality and the killing of George Floyd. So it could be that that was like a, an entirely different group. Um, the one, you know, I really don't know, but that's what I've heard. Yeah, I, I just, I just want to say just a couple of things. I, I agree with, uh, with, with their other panelists and their uh, uh, assessments, but I, I'm going to say um, with, if we didn't have COVID-19 um, and, and then we didn't have the Floyd uh, issue, we were gonna have some type of protests in this community and across the country because things, um, the housing situation, the job situation in our community is not or has not gotten any better. And so whether it was a official protest where people coming together and marching downtown or or, or, you know, things like that. The bigger picture, I think that what we should be thinking about and what we should be working uh, together on is what can we learn from this 
um, to create equality. Um, you know, um, anger, anger, uh, it was an opportunity to show frustration, to show anger. But I, I'm the more and more that I, I've been in this business for about 25 years and I grew up in public housing myself. So what I've seen over the last, I'm going to say seven years, are people are more aggressive because at some point, their breaking point is I have nowhere else to go. So um, I think as a community, uh, at least as a community, we need to think outside the box on as things come back online, what are we going to do different to ensure, to ensure that people um, are getting and receiving equality, whether jobs, opportunities, access to education, and you know, being the largest provider of affordable housing, it's not just affordable housing, but it's the word quality added onto it. it that, that's what we have to do, I believe, in our community. Right. You know, just looking at, um, you know, the, the health disparities that COVID-19 highlighted and the economic disparities, you know, job disparities, business disparities, and then seeing the video of George Floyd being murdered, um, putting those together, it's hard for me to understand how anyone can say there aren't disparities in this country because before it was, it seemed easy for a lot of people to say, you know, really, you're just kind of making that up. There aren't disparities. Everybody's treated the same. We don't have a race problem. But I think with these two, the two issues happening together, I just can't imagine anyone could, could deny that there definitely is a problem. So um, we'll see. Okay, um, so another, oh, and um, Janice Jones, welcome, you're here, you've joined us. Hello, yeah. how are you? Good I'm well, I'm, I'm well. I got to remember to charge my laptop uh, <laughs> before uh, realizing I had no battery. So um, please excuse my tardiness, but I've had a chance to listen as I've been trying to join in. You know, I just echo the sentiment of, of what I've been hearing so far, I mean, COVID, has definitely magnified a lot of the disparities that we knew were existing, particularly in housing. But you know, housing turns into blocks, blocks turn into neighborhoods, and neighborhoods turn into communities. So we see um, you know, these disparities uh, lay bare. Right, absolutely. OK, now, uh, Ms. Jones, this is a question for you. Um, it is, with, with developers gentrifying our communities, I hear that a lot of people end up homeless. They have to move when developers acquire their buildings. What can we do about that? Well, I, I've, you know, I get this question a lot, you know, when I go out and do presentations in the communities or someone just calls our office or emails me. And one of the things I say is that, you know, folks need to know um, from, you know, step one, what's going on in their communities. Be able to recognize the signs that your community may be ripe for gentrification. Um, things like new commercial development, um, lots of people in suits walking around looking at buildings. Um, you've been on a, an annual lease for many years and suddenly uh, your property manager tells you that he wants to take the, the building to month to month. Um, you know, commercial development is one key thing. Um, the loss of some businesses in the community that have been there a long time can be an issue. Um, foreclosure can be a, a sign, you know, um, you know, properties that are um, REO that aren't being well cared for. So there's a lot of different factors that are indicators where speculators kind of, you know, go in and check some boxes and decide, you know, this is a, you know, opportunity for, me as a speculator to make money. So know those signs, stay connected in your communities and talk to your neighbors as tenants. Because tenants can sometimes organize around um, these issues to kind of work out a more favorable deal for themselves and their families. Okay, great advice. Okay, this next question is for Mr. Johnson and it says, what is CMHA doing about people who lost their jobs and couldn't pay rent? Is there any help for tenants who can't pay rent? And there's a similar question for Mr. Marson, Mr. Lawson. So what, let's start with Mr. Johnson. 
Well, what uh, CMHA is doing uh, through our process is we're allowed to change a person's rent. So if a person has zero income um, that lives in one of our properties, we actually can change their rent and reduce their rent to what their income levels are. Uh, the other thing that we're doing uh, through outreach and our partnerships, uh, we're trying to link people up to uh, JFS that has their PRC, uh, the city has a program, Mark has a program that are help, helping families and individuals to pay rent. Because one of the things that we know, the, the very first thing that we were talking about when we started was when this uh, process opens up and the courts open up and eviction you know, starts. And what we wanna be sure is that people are educated, one, if you do or owe rent, you should pay rent even though the moratorium is on because you don't want to get behind and then say, oh, I thought I didn't have to pay rent because the eviction process wasn't there. And I will tell you, um, we have gotten a lot of residents to say, well, I don't have to pay rent right now. So um, that education, um, so we're doing that education. We do that education through mailings. We do that education through one calls and reminding residents, and then obviously partnering with the other agencies that uh, are in the community. But the biggest thing is we have the ability to change your rent to zero um, if you've lost all your income. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Lawson, do you want to weigh in on that? Because the next question really has to do, it's the same question. Uh, what services does the CAA have to help people who can't pay rent? Sure. Um, so echoing what Greg said, uh, let's go back and do it again. So. I, I did answer it before, but that, that's fine. It, it, this is the kind of thing you can't say enough, honestly. And, right. and to echo Greg, you know, and, and whatever, whoever your landlord is, reach out to your landlord if you are struggling uh, and try to work something out. But Greg is exactly right. You do have to pay your rent um, at the end of the day. And we've got a lot of programs uh, that help. So, you know, reach out to us, call us at 569-1840. Uh, we've got lots of different pots of money to help folks with rental assistance uh, and, and in general up to about $50,000, $52,000 a year annual income for a family of four. If you're below that, uh, we can help you, but don't let that dissuade you. There's uh, you know, it's quite a broad spectrum of, of different pots of money that we can help. And if I can just go, go back to the question that you asked Janice about gentrification in neighborhoods, um, you know, this is something that we've seen and uh, an example of this is in Madisonville. And, you know, as uh, this is something near and dear to Reverend Lynch's uh, generational wealth in the black community. And, you know, the institutional racism that existed and made it very hard for African Americans to own homes. And then uh, when they do, and then you have, gener you have uh, gentrification and then your property taxes go up and you may not have a mortgage anymore and you're maybe you're elderly on a fixed income. And then you are subject to a property tax foreclosure and those are ongoing. They haven't stopped. And so, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that really uh, hurts families and ends up hurting communities when those folks are leaving some, some families that have been there for generations. So um, that's something we're seeing. And while we don't have uh, foreclosure assistance at legal, at, we, at, at CA, we send those folks to legal aid. They do have money for foreclosure assistance. Oh, good, excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, and so still on the housing topic, this next question is for Ms. Jones. And it says, what kinds of housing discrimination cases are you seeing the most these days? Is there a trend? Yeah, so, um, so we were concerned. Um, so we, we see a lot of different types of housing discrimination cases, unfortunately. Um, but when COVID-19 came on the scene, one of the things we were immediately concerned about was people with disabilities, people who have been impacted by COVID and who are now disabled. So if you, for example, may um, have had COVID, and just because you've had COVID doesn't mean you're disabled, but you may have had COVID, COVID and that made you disabled, something that impacts a major life, life activity. So we're concerned about folks who um, now need accommodations and now need to make um, special arrangements due to the fact they've been ill. Another thing, unfortunately, whenever there's an economic crisis, um, in any community um, of any type, we see an increase of sexual harassment cases, unfortunately, because we have uh, vulnerable 
women in our community who are low income and now there's another um, way to exploit that vulnerability. So if they, um, so everybody knows there's a pandemic, everybody knows there's been a loss of income. And so we've started to hear certain cases about um, folks who are, know they're gonna have issues with paying their rent and are concerned about, um, you know, either a hostile environment type sexual harassment or a quid pro quo type sexual harassment, this for that. Um, and then we also, of course, are concerned, um, you know, very broadly about um, policies and practices that property managers can put in place that violate the CARES Act. Because we feel like that's also a potential indicator since we know COVID-19 impacts people of color um, more readily, where there's a um, situation where there could be disparate impact if there are policies and practices in place that um, violate the CARES Act in some way that may also trigger the Fair Housing Act. So those are three key areas that we're concerned about. On the landlord tenant side of things, which we, so people who call us don't necessarily tell us that, you know, I believe uh, there's a violation of the Fair Housing Act, you know, and, and quote the code. They say, I mean, treating them fairly. Right. So um, lots of things around, you know, who can come to the, the property, um, you know, the lack of use of facilities, they can't, they're having trouble reaching property management. Um, and then always um, looming with folks who um, may have had uh, a court date for an eviction back in March when we all shut down. You know, there's always that question of, um, you know, self-help evictions and uh, property management turning off the utilities, which we know is illegal. So those are some of the things that we're concerned about and that we've, we've seen in, in varying degrees. Well, do you, do you find landlords doing that, uh, turning off utilities? I mean, it seems like by now everyone knows you can't do that yes um yeah um so you know i think we had a couple of cases last week where that was like an overarching threat you know so this was a family that said they were going to be out at the end of march and um you know for whatever reason it, a mass pandemic or <laughs> you know they weren't quite able to move um so you know so now this this tenant is concerned because there's these texts and you know like you know he says well you know what about the utilities what about the rent what about this and so the, there's a lot of anxiety around you know that's something that could happen of course we tell them to call us immediately and we often refer those cases to legal aid all right, thank you so much. Um, this question is from Kelly Prather, and uh, it's and I just saw Kelly down at the at the protest organized by Iris Rowley earlier this afternoon. So Kelly, thanks for joining us. You you ran home and joined us. It's great. So Kelly's question is: Are there any plans to address housing that is designed specifically for seniors? The buildings that have seniors and disabled citizens present safety issues. So, so I'll, I'll take a first shot at that one. Um, one of the things, um, uh, thank you for that question, because that is, uh, that's something that happened, uh, I know, in the public housing uh, arena uh, many years ago with, uh, actually, President Clinton was uh, in office, where um, he lumped um, disabled with seniors, and that's where we, or how we got where we are today. I know in our properties. But one of the things that uh, we have been doing over the last several years, we've actually built um, additional senior uh, designated housing. But just uh, a few months ago, right in January, we got three uh, of our local properties in the city of Cincinnati designated senior only. And this is the first time that this has been done in about 20 years. So. Um, obviously, we can't uh, just turn and uh, put everyone out that's there, but all of the new residents that go into those buildings uh, will be seniors, and then those buildings will be turned um, to senior-only buildings. I know when I first came into the community about eight years ago, um, we had a study done, and one of the things that it actually showed is that there was going to be a need for more senior housing uh, in Hamilton County, and that need is just growing and growing and growing. So I, at, at CMHA, um, we are, like I said, we just did those three buildings, and the last new construction buildings actually were senior designated buildings as well. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and let's see there, uh, here's a question here from Eric Kearney about senior housing. So I'm scrolling back to that one. And he says, since we're talking about senior housing, he says, how are senior citizens do, how are the senior citizens doing who live in CMHA housing? Do they have enough food? Um, depends, I guess, you know, personal items and also medicine. Well, I think that's, uh, I think the, the loaded question is, do they have enough? Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, through our resident uh, uh, jurisdictional wide council, they've been doing an excellent job and we've been partnering with them to help them uh, get some funding uh, to help supply uh, for seniors in, in some of our developments. Um, but there's always a need. So I don't think we're ever gonna get to a place where we say that, oh, they're done, they have enough. Um, and we can definitely always use additional uh, supplies and things like that. And so we, we are, um, I reached out to Cincinnati Foundation, which um, I was able to be a conduit to get money to JRAP to buy some of those things. We actually, the Housing Authority purchased um, some of those things for some of our high rises. And then uh, we've actually had a great partnership um, with the host of the show to uh, provide us with masks and education as well. But I don't, I don't think um, we have enough. You may hear us from Renee, yeah, Renee. <laughs> um, but um, we don't have enough and, and they definitely continue, will continue to need more. But um, through that partnership, they've been doing a great job of helping uh, supply for those seniors in those high rises. Okay, and great. And Dan, Michelle, I also think the majority of churches are also reaching out to their seniors because a lot of our churches have a large senior population and, and most of us are making sure that our seniors uh, have their needs met uh, to the best of uh, our ability. So uh, we thank Greg Johnson for what he's doing. And anything else you need, Greg, just let us know. I mean, we have this large faith community out here. Um, and you know, although we have limited resources, uh, we do have soldiers who are willing to be out there. Yeah, I remember, uh, was it Easter when you all had like a huge line of cars, people coming by to pick up Easter dinner from the, from the cars and that was, that was fantastic. And you, you do a lot of um, dinners at the church actually, I understand, mm -hmm. so that's, that's fantastic. Um, okay, I've got two Food questions. for us, Jen, Michelle. We, we, we have three or four food pantries a month that have uh, really tripled um, you know, in, in capacity. There's so much more need. It definitely skews towards the elderly and and it is a line of cars. It's really a drive-through now where we put uh, boxes of food in, in folks' trunks. And, and we've partnered with a lot of churches and are willing to partner with even more. We've partnered with Pastor Casey Smith and Michael Scruggs and Bishop Bobby Hilton and others to have even more of, of our regular food pantries and be happy to do That's even fantastic. more of that. So Mark, what about a, a schedule for that? Is there a schedule so people know when to go or? Yeah, it's best to just go on our website for that, cincy-ca.org. Uh, just because there's so many and, and you know one is at our place at, in Bond Hill uh, another one is across the street at Tridestone we do one at Camp Washington and then we partner with the different churches. Oh that's fantastic thank you so much. Okay well Mr. Lawson while I have you um, here uh, so Iris Rowley says um, please ask Mr. Lawson this fun fact will the CAA <laughs> continue to be a partner with the Universal Circus after the pandemic? I wonder if that's coming back this year. Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, it's been a strong partnership. Uh, I love Iris. Um, you know, I, so I, I was on the board at CA for 17 years before I started there and board chair for 12. So I, I know a lot about that. Um, with, the, with, the, with the pandemic and, and that combined with, um, sort of, I don't know if it's a full ban on, on, on elephants and all that stuff. I just don't know the answer to that right now, Iris. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to do it. I know it's a great community event and I love uh, bringing folks to our, our place in Bond Hill. Um, I just don't know if we can pull it off this year. Our doors aren't open right now, and we're honestly not in a big hurry to do it because we want to really work out the safety of our clients and our staff, and, and we're, not, we're not there yet. Yeah, I, th I think all these events are just on hold for now. Um, we just have to, hopefully this, this vaccine is coming. I mean, that would be, that would, that would help so much. Um, and let's see, Iris, you had another question and you said, oh, and this is back to Mr. Johnson. Please ask Mr. Johnson his thoughts on the final rule of section three 
and how will he handle this? <laughs> um, You'll have section, to tell us about section three. Sec, sec, section, I assume uh, Iris is talking about section three as far as uh, jobs uh, for uh, residents and jobs for uh, residents in Hamilton County community. Ms. Jones is um, shaking her head, so I think that's, that must be, that must be <laughs> what we're talking about. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So um, what my thoughts are, I don't know, a lot of people don't know that Cincinnati Metropolitan Housing Authority is probably in the top five in the nation of creating jobs for Section 3 residents uh, in our community. And we just actually won an award a few years ago for that. I don't think the new ruling goes deep enough. I think that we have to do more as a community and do more as a nation uh, to uh, expand the bandwidth to allow uh, for additional uh, requirements to force these government dollars that are going into buildings and going into projects um, to be sure that they're getting Section 3 uh, residents and Section 3 businesses. Um, it's, it's, it's some, if you go through a cursor, it's easy to meet those minimum numbers. And at CMHA, uh, I've doubled the numbers uh, on top of what HUD requirements are. And we've exceeded those numbers um, in real dollars uh, over the past five years. So um, my short answer is no, I don't think it goes deep enough. Uh, and the longer answer is we got to continue to keep pushing to make sure people are not getting percentages, they're getting real dollars. Okay, thank you so much. Um, here's another question from, from Kelly Prather. Um, and this, let's see, I, this is to you again, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Kelly says, can you discuss the plans for Millville? Mr. Johnson, since a lot of the units have been torn down around Millville Circle, the tenants are worried that they will be displaced. And the city listed the Millville Community Council inactive a couple of years ago, which made them believe they would lose their homes. Is there any truth to this? Uh, no, actually, uh, there's uh, the for Millville. We are uh, working on a uh, MDNA management development agreement with a partner to actually redo Millville. The reason that those units were taken down at Millville is because of the hill slide. So uh, the, the, the hill sliding, taking those units around, down around that perimeter allowed okay. for if the hill were to slide based on the numbers, it wouldn't reach any of the existing buildings. But um, where those buildings were close to the edge of that hill slide, and we actually had a building that was hit um, about a year and a half ago from the okay. hill slide. So, uh, the future for Millville, I think, is bright. Um, we're, not, we're looking for redeveloping it. The units need to be uh, rehabbed. So we're looking to rehab those units with a, with a partner. It's probably going to be about a three-phase approach uh, and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of between 15 and $20 million project will be, be there. So Millville um, is on the course of actually being preserved. And just while I'm on that subject, all of our housing, um, I am on a course to uh, rehab uh, all of our public housing. Um, and it's probably going to be a little over a billion dollars worth of rehab. Um, doesn't mean we don't need more in our community. But um, the, the, my goal is for the units that we do have to bring them up and provide quality affordable housing. That's fantastic. Can, can I ask Greg, what, what's your timeline on that? We are that? actually working on that right now. We started last July with Sutterview, um, which was our first, um, it's $30 million rehab. I don't know if you've been there right past there. We've done the bottom uh, cul-de-sac and we're coming out of there. Uh, our next uh, project was the Evanston. Uh, we're rehabbing the Evanston right now. Uh, our plans are to close on the Pine Crest uh, actually next month to start rehabbing it and on Park Eden and on uh, Mariana Terrace. So we'll have at least five projects between now and December in rehab approach. And then we just got a tax credit award to build new property 
uh, a Bennett Point downtown across from the casino. So we're working hard to try to, with the dollars that we have and the processes that we have to go through to, to make this happen. So the real goal is to have 100% mm -hmm. of the properties rehab between now and 20, late 2024, early 2025. And that and you have you know, a large depends. minority spend. You have a large minority. We have a large, we have, we have a large minority spend. I think that's why Iris um, asked a question on the section three, okay. um, because we, the way our we approach it, um, yes, yes, we do. Uh, I, I'll give you a little a little example, and then I'll let you move on, because uh, I get excited about this. We just uh, we do uh, lo we do local contractors. Um, I have 40 contractors, um, small section three MB, WB contractors that help us with work orders and turning units. That's an unprecedented number for the housing authority to ever have. And it was the largest number the board just approved last month. Good, That's thank fantastic. You. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. That is wonderful. Um, can, so can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Can, oh, sure. At, at the end of the day, Greg, are you able to provide one for one replacement uh, so we don't lose any affordable housing? Is that the plan at the We're end? Not, yeah, it's all about rehab. So if anything, 90% uh, of this is gonna be rehab. If there's anything that it just doesn't make sense to rehab it, it would definitely be one for one replacement. Right. All right, that's great. Um, okay, this, we speak of Iris. Iris is keeping us going here. So this question is from Iris Rowley and it is to Dr. Kent Robinson and she says, uh, Dr. Robinson, what can the Black community do to ensure the proper amount of COVID testing, whether it's the antibody test or the test that tells if you're infected or not? Yeah, what was the first part of the question? I did hear it. She said, so Iris Rowley asked, what can the Black community do to ensure the proper amount of COVID testing, whether it's the antibody test or the test that tells if you're infected or not? Yes, and and I good question. And I do uh, acknowledge uh, Reverend Lynch and his work uh, with Mercy uh, in order to get the, the process started, for, uh, to help get that process started uh, there in the community. And there have been a lot of testing and there's been some COVID-19 uh, detection in that regard. Uh, what I would say is that uh, people continue to get tested, um, uh, particularly if they have any symptoms. And as far as I know at this point, there's uh, not a designated end to when that uh, testing will, will stop. So that, that should continue. Now recognize that that is the antigen test, but not the antibody test. The antibody test is not ready for prime time so to speak, at this point. Uh, it's used very specifically uh, in situations where if you have a multi-system problem that's late in the illness of COVID-19, such as this Kawasaki that we're seeing in, in, in certain children or for persons in the hospital for a long period of time with COVID and they're not seeming to get better, uh, then antibody tests are, are, used, in that, are used in that situation. Uh, because the antibody test is not, uh, we don't know if that's a, a, that protects a person against subsequent COVID uh, infection. We don't know that yet. We also don't know what concentration is needed uh, in order to uh, uh, suggest immunity. And uh, we also don't know how long, if it does suggest immunity, that it lasts. I will say, also say this, though, that uh, there have been, I, I have had some patients who had antibodies from people who have recovered from COVID uh, uh, at a certain hospital in the city. And they've uh, seemed to, the outcome seemed to have, have improved. So I, I think in terms of the antigen testing that's going on at Mercy right now, that'll continue for right now indefinitely. I haven't heard that, that, that when that's going to end. And people just go out and get tested, uh, please. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it sounds promising. I'm sorry, Reverend Lynch. Right. And also, I have to thank um, Iris Rowley um, and CAI for getting that testing site in Bond Hill. And I thank Mercy and Dr. Kent and Dr. Melvin. Uh, Mercy actually had four testing sites uh, before we got the one in Bond Hill open, but they were all out uh, in the outer ring of our city. And at that time, what we were hearing was this thing was disproportionately impacting the African-American community. And so uh, Mercy stepped up to the plate. And I know uh, recently there was a testing site in Avondale at Hirsch. 
But I think also what the black community and the entire community needs to do is continue practicing safe practices. So as America reopens, and it's just, you know, what they highlight is, you know, we just can't wait to get back to the pub, back to the restaurant, back to the swimming pool. If you saw the people in the Ozarks, the black community cannot afford that. If everybody else jumps back in the pool, we cannot follow behind them for a number of the reasons. You know, the morbidity in our community, we, we can't do that. We can't, you know, black church people want to know, Reverend, when can I come back to church? Like, no time soon. <laughs> like, you know, we just, we can't afford that right now. So we have to continue. Uh, so, right, social distancing, wearing the mask, and all those things that are important right now. Uh, those are Those are our safeguards right now. Right. Yeah, we try to tell people, you know, we want you to stay alive and stay healthy so that you can come back. Don't don't rush back now, for sure. So, um, so the last question here, and anyone can answer this: um, What are your thoughts on the Cincinnati media's coverage of the COVID nineteen pandemic and its relationship to race and poverty? Any thoughts on that? I, I, that's I, think that, I think that one thing we need to do, uh, and I hope to, hello? Yeah, oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear I, you. I think, I think one thing we need to do um, as it relates to uh, uh, coverage and specifically for funding, because again, uh, health disparities, this is just an example of health disparity um, in America as it relates to the African American also the Hispanic community and, and the poor white community. Uh, and so in terms of being, being able to uh, be able to get those things, those funding uh, to the community that, that need to be gotten uh, when the researchers are going about documenting who has the disease, race and ethnicity, sex, sexual identity, age, disability, socioeconomic status, and geographic location, all those things need to be taken into consideration. So I think that uh, that needs to be more of a focus uh, in, in general uh, for the data that's being collected. And I think that uh, uh, as we emphasize that kind of thing, you know, I think that's going to be better overall for, uh, you know, for funding to get where it needs to get uh, in the African American community for this in particular, but uh, more in general for broader problems of health disparity, which this is just a reflection of. Okay, thank you so much. I can't believe, um, Ms. Ms. Jones, I didn't catch you off, did I? Just, just real quick, I wanted to say something. Um, there's a study that's came out recently um, um, from the Data for Black Lives. Um, if you Google Data for Black Lives COVID-19, it'll come up. And it talks a lot about how data is being used. We're seeing maps and layered technology and reality and, you know, all different types of, um, you know, 21st century data described and uh, this pandemic. But I would also say, you know, uh, racial bias goes into those algorithms um, just like anything else. And so I would say any reports, any, um, you know, reports that we use to describe uh, the pandemic should also have um, some um, core uh, examination by data ethicists around how the data is being used and how these, uh, you know, morbidity, morbidities, I think that's good, you know, are being characterized um, to assure that, you know, this algorithmic data is not um, touched by that bias. Okay, we will definitely check that out. Um, data for Black Lives slash COVID-19, it sounds like. And we'll have it on the COVID-19 community resources.com website so the people can find, as well as all the numbers you've given us. Um, all of you, like me and Mr. Lawson, gave us some numbers to call as well. So I just, you know, we're out of time. I just can't believe how quickly the time passes. I just want to thank our wonderful, wonderful panelists, Reverend Damon Lynch III, Greg Johnson, Ms. Denise Jones, uh, Mr. Mark Lawson, and Dr. Kent Robinson. Uh, you've been wonderful. I want to thank all of our attendees and to remind you, the survey, please fill it out. We read those every week and analyze them to come up with topics that you are interested in. So we really need you to fill out that survey and you'll see it right there at the bottom of your screen. So I want to thank you again. We'll see you next Saturday at four, but let's have a few closing remarks. 
from Renee Mahaffey Harris, President and CEO of the Center for Closing the Health Gap. Renee? First of all, I want to thank you, each panelist, uh, for the information you shared. And we must continue to talk and inform our communities, as we can see from the questions that were asked today. And finally, I want to thank our partners, the Urban League, Eddie Keon, uh, Eric Kearney with African American Chamber of Commerce, and Joe Mallory with NAACP, as well as Dr. Roosevelt Walker with Cincinnati Medical Association. Uh, my heart is heavy today. I think. Our country's heart is heavy today, but I do know that God will see us through and that together, each of our organizations, each of us advocating and holding accountable our elected officials and all of those who make policies in this country, we will be able to make the changes that will ensure that we have safety for all of us, for our children, for our family, um, no matter what the color of our skin is. And so um, we must stand together and work together. And I think Iris Rowley um, and all those who were part of the protest, uh, this, the peaceful protest at Washington Park, as well as Ennis Tate and his work. Um, so thank you all. Um, we are going to get through this time together, but we are gonna knock down the barriers and challenges and, and systems and structures that we continue to see negatively impacting the black community in particular. So I thank you for joining us, everyone. See you next Saturday at 4 p.m. And I thank our panelists. We really appreciate your time and all the information and expertise you shared. And we will continue to work with you and elevate all of the work that each of you are doing. Thank you again. And you have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll see you next week. Reverend Lynch, I'll be giving you a call.